Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interviews with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period and revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Katie Turner Getty, writer, speaker, and frequent contributor to the Journal of the American, Re American Revolution. This presentation is brought to you by the Real American Revolution public television series and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. So Katie, would you be kind enough to introduce our guest today? Thank you, Randy, I would be happy to. Robert J. Allison is a professor of history at Suffolk University and chairman of Revolution 250, a consortium of organizations that are planning commemorations for the 250th anniversary of the American Revolution in Massachusetts. Professor Allison earned his doctorate at Harvard, History of American Civilization, and his undergraduate degree at the Harvard Extension School. He is currently president of the South Boston Historical Society, vice president of the Colonial Society of Massachusetts, a trustee of the USS Constitution Museum, a fellow of the American Antiquarian Society and the Massachusetts Historical Society, as well as an honorary member of the Society of the Cincinnati. He has written numerous books about the American Revolution, as well as other books on American history. And Professor Allison, welcome to our show. Thank you very much, Katie. It's great to be here with you and Randy. Thank you. Um, Professor Allison, as you know, the Warren Society has been recent, recently interviewing authors and historians about the events that led up to the American Revolution, such as the smallpox epidemic of 1764, and also the early stages of the rebellion itself. And we wondered if you could start off by talking about the Boston Massacre as a precipitating event, for example, how was the African-American community in the 19th century successful in helping to transform the notion of Crispus Attucks as from being part of this urban mob of so-called sailors, saucy boys, jack ties, and mulattoes into more of an American martyr and an icon of liberty who took action into his own hands? That's a very good question. Katie, and it really is Boston's black community that pioneers that. William Cooper Nell was an historian in Boston on Beacon Hill. It lived black community in Boston then lived on the North Slope of Beacon Hill. And William Cooper Nell seeing in the 1830s and 1840s, the way the trajectory of American history seemed to be going, that we really needed to claim this history. And so he wrote his book, Colored Patriots of the American Revolution, which begins with Crispus Attucks, because here is someone who was shot in the massacre and is buried with the other victims of the massacre. And this is at a time when American society is reconsidering what it means, the Declaration of Independence pronouncement that all men are created equal. He wouldn't have found an argument about that in 1776 or in 1770. This is what Jefferson called a self-evident truth. But in the 1830s, um, political folks and historians are saying, well, they couldn't have meant that because we knew they owned slaves and we knew they didn't treat people the same according to the law. So they must have meant all white men or all men like us. But what Nell is saying is, no, this did mean that. And the fact that Attucks is shot and these British soldiers are put on trial for their lives is testament to the fact that in the eyes of the law, Crispus Attucks was the equal of anyone else entitled to the same. Now, now, well, we know the law didn't afford them all of the same rights, but the protection of his life is it's a fundamental thing here. So now, is asserting that addicts does count. And if you think about the trial itself, we have these soldiers on trial for their lives for the shooting of addicts and the other individuals, but also two of the witnesses, three of the witnesses are people of color. One is a free man, Newton Prince, who's a patri pastry chef, another is Andrew, who is, is described in the transcript as a servant to Oliver Wendell. Wendell is the great grandfather of Oliver Wendell Holmes. And they are testifying. So their testimony is considered in court. And another precipitating thing in leading to the reconsideration of the massacre and really making this a central event 
was the Dred Scott decision in March of 1857, in which the Supreme Court said at the time the Constitution was written, a black man had no rights which a white man is bound to respect. And Nell and others knew that that was simply wrong, that here, because here is Crispus Attucks. And in fact, Boston had commemorated the 5th of March, the anniversary of the uh, massacre every year until 1783, when it shifted to consider to making July 4th the anniversary date. But the following, and remember the Dred Scott decision is handed down on March the 7th of, seven, of uh, 1857, or March the 6th of 1857. The following year, the black community in Boston gathers at Faneuil Hall to have Crispus Attucks Day remembering that on March 5th, 1770, Attucks and others were killed. And there's also, we know the Revere engraving of the uh, massacre, which shows this really very well-dressed crowd being innocent crowd being shot at by these British soldiers. There's another engraving done in the 1850s that shows Attucks holding a club and he's grabbing Private Montgomery's gun, which is similar to what we know happened from the various witnesses to the day. So they're making addicts into a more central figure here and commemorating addicts as central to it. In the, and it's actually Boston's black community that's responsible in the 1880s for saving the old state house, which Boston wanted to demolish because here you have this valuable piece of real estate. We have this old building on it. And Boston's black community wants to save it because of its importance. And they get together with a Brahmin leadership in Boston, who also see significance in the building and save it. And in the commemorations to, uh, um, of the saving of the old state house and the building of a monument on Boston Common in the 1880s, Frederick Douglass had been invited to speak, could not because of his health. He sends a wonderful letter about how much he would like to be here once again in the Hall of Liberty. And um, John Mercer Langston, who was the president of Howard University, writes an apologetic letter. And it's clear from President Langston's letter, he thought all of the victims were black at the massacre. It's mm -hmm. so Crispus Attucks becomes a figure in the 19th century. And it, in, as I said, William Cooper Nell wants to demonstrate the importance of African-Americans to the civic life of the nation. Interesting. Well, Professor Allison, uh, we acknowledge that the Boston Massacre was really spun very effectively by Paul Revere as a propaganda tool that really, I guess, began with the burying of the victims. Yes. But can you tell us about that funeral in particular that was staged in the town of Boston and how it really set the stage for future remembrance ceremonies? What was so unique about the funeral? 10,000 people participate in that funeral. The population of Boston mm. was about 12,000. And they have the bodies of Attucks and Benjamin Caldwell are at Faneuil Hall. This is the town's meeting house. Then as now, if you die, it's up to your family to take care of your burial. But in this case, the burial is at town expense. I should say that a week earlier, there had been a 12 year old boy killed by a customs informer. And that the death, of, the death and burial of Christopher Sider becomes kind of a model for this. Sider's body had been carried out of Faneuil Hall by 200 Boston schoolboys, and his procession was followed by about 2,000 people. And Phyllis Wheatley wrote a poem about cider. And now we have this other funeral. So Caldwell, who is a sailor, Attucks, who is a sailor, strangers in the town, their bodies are taken to Faneuil Hall. Samuel Maverick, the um, ivory turner apprentice, 17-year-old boy who was also killed, uh, his body is take, carried from his home and then the body of Patrick Carr, the rope worker is taken from his home. And they all, these three processions converge in front of the old state house at Dock Square where the, in, the massacre happened. And then they process down what is today probably Congress Street to the Liberty Tree at Boston Neck. And they uh, march around the Liberty Tree. Now 10,000 people are following this procession and then add it, and then they go up through Boston Common to the Granary Burying Ground. And it's a plot that's owned by someone sympathetic to the cause. And later Samuel Adams will be buried in this same plot. But they're all are interred there, all of them together. Attucks, Gray, Caldwell, and Maverick. Uh, Patrick um, Carr, who is an Irish um, guy who had also been shot, he dies that day 
the following week, his body will be placed there too. So the victims are all buried together, buried at town expense with church bells in town tolling to signify the um, travesty that has happened. So Samuel Adams really orchestrates this. And Adams, remember, was not as well known then publicly as he is now. He was someone who operated behind the scenes, very well known if you are engaged in politics, but he really liked to operate with other people being the front person, John Hancock, when Hancock was on the same side, or um, James Otis, and Otis was having a mental breakdown at this time. So this is really a Samuel Adams is emerging as um, the public political leader of this. He had been behind the scenes as the political leader, the orchestrator of this for a while. And it's the day after the massacre when Adams and a delegation from the Boston town meeting come into the council chamber and demand that the governor remove the British troops. This is, this is really Adams becoming the leader of this patriot movement when there are other people who might have been more thought of. It's a, a year or two later, Samuel Adams, John Adams are both elected to the Massachusetts legislature and former Governor Shirley looking at the list of people who had just been elected from Boston says, well, Hancock I know and Cushing I know, but where the devil this brace of Adamses came from, I can't say. <laughs> but Adams is really a master at using propaganda, as you can see with the Revere engraving and the town then is writing a report about what happened, getting the depositions from witnesses. And they make sure that their account, which is called a true account of the horrid massacre perpetrated by soldiers of His Majesty's 29th Regiment, that gets to London first. And the Revere print is the frontispiece for this. And so they're really using, it's a horrid massacre. There's another version more sympathetic to the British soldiers that calls it, you know, the late unhappy disturbance on King Street. So it's an unhappy disturbance or it's a horrid massacre. Sometimes when I'm teaching this, my students are a little surprised to find out only five people die. Well, uh, I, you know, of course, if you are one of the victims, it's a massacre enough, but right. it's really using this. And he's drawing on actually uh, the St. George's Field massacre in England, which had inflamed the Whigs there. So Adams is really a master at using mm -hmm. propaganda in a very effective way. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Fascinating, Professor, thank you. Um, we touched on this a tiny bit earlier, but we would be curious to know your thoughts on the Boston Massacre anniversary orations. We know that Joseph Warren spoke at these events in both 1772 and 1775. Yes. And so we wondered if you could comment on what did it mean to the community to commemorate this anniversary of March 5th? And what did it mean to be a speaker at these events? And how did the British view these orations as they were happening? And maybe we can touch on the tense atmosphere of the 1775 oration in particular. That's a very good question. Because in 1783, Boston says, for on, actually on March the 5th, James Otis, who had been brought back from his rustication, makes the motion at the town meeting that henceforward we should commemorate July the 4th. And so July the 4th becomes the date when Bostonians have these orations, which were printed. And John Adams later said that you can trace the social history of the country, by that he meant really the intellectual history of the country, through these orations and what they're saying. And the first anniversary was March the 5th of 1771. Actually, Thomas Hutchinson, the former governor, is at his home in uh, Milton, and he hears the church bells tolling at noon. He happens to be writing a letter to someone. And he says, the fact that they are commemorating this show, shows how poorly they understand what happened. And he, of course, refers to the Sons of Liberty as the Sons of Violence. So he's very much on the other side. You know, and of course, he had had his house torn down by the Sons of Liberty in 1765. So he's quite sensitive on this subject. But um, the first orator was um, John Lovell, who was a teacher at Boston Latin School. They couldn't really find anyone else who want, could do this at short notice. And Lovell's father remains loyal to the crown. In fact, both of them leave Boston on, in um, March of 1776 when the loyalists and the British army evacuate. Uh, the senior level as an exile, the younger level as a prisoner of war. You have, though, the town and actually Samuel Adams on behalf of the town. And this is an official action of the town of Boston commemorating this event every year on March the 5th. 
And in addition to the oration, you'll have people illuminating their windows with cutouts of scenes like the Revere's engraving of the scene and of liberty being attacked by um, the forces of darkness and other really ways of demonstrating how we see this happening. And then the orators will make this point about this being an attack on liberty. And Warren is the orator in 1772 and does a wonderful job. I mean, he is really a very good um, speaker. Um, 1773, they invite John Adams. Adams thought that would be difficult since he, of course, had defended the soldiers and the soldiers are acquitted. And he thought it would be difficult for him. He, and, but he did say, had the soldiers been executed, it would have been as foul a blot on us as the execution of the witches in 1691. Uh, he gives, get, he, he and Josiah Quincy guarantee that the soldiers get a fair trial. And that I think is one of the big things about this event, that the soldiers get a fair trial and are acquitted by a jury. Now, 1773, as I said, Adams does, and so Benjamin Church does. Um, 74, it is John Hancock. And in 74, of course, later on in that year, the Port of Boston is closed. This is in reaction to the destruction of the tea. And the town is occupied once again by British soldiers. So in March of 1775, it's difficult to get someone willing to go and give this oration. And General Gage is really expecting that this might lead to a violent confrontation, which would then give him the opportunity to use force against these hotheads in town. So the Old South Meeting House, which is where most of the orations were held because it was the largest building in town, was packed. Um, thousands of people crowded into it. And the Warren couldn't get in, couldn't get in through the door because it was too crowded. So he climbs through a window behind the pulpit. He's wearing a toga uh, too, for dramatic effect. And he gets into the pulpit and the steps leading up from the floor of the uh, meeting house to the pulpit are packed with British soldiers, uh, a group from Wales who were there in their uniforms. That is, they're waiting for anything to touch this off. And at one point during his oration, as Warren is talking about our streets once again, occupied by British troops, our harbor filled with British ships of war. One of these guys sitting on the top step holds up a fistful of bullets and Warren doesn't flint. He keeps talking, keeps it, but he does pull, reach into the folds of his toga and he pulls out a handkerchief and he drapes it over the bullets as he keep, continues his oration. <laughs> Tremendous dramatic effect here. And it's a wonderful oration by Joseph Warren. And it's really striking that um, just two months later, he's gonna die at Bunker Hill. He has become the leader of this movement, an intellectual leader, as well as a political leader. He, like Josiah Quincy, really understand the stakes here. And they understand that this is going to lead to violence. They want to prevent that as long as they can. And also want to do what Samuel Adams always advised to, put your enemy in the wrong and keep him in the wrong. So the 1775 oration happens while the town is occupied. And after that, we do see the orators being younger people, not the leaders, the way Adam, John Adams, uh, Hancock, Warren had been, but it's an opportunity they see for younger talent to show itself. Thank you, Professor. Okay. So things did continue to intensify after that then, I guess. Oh, that definitely did. Yes. As I said, uh, just, you know, six weeks or so after, well, this is March when Warren gives mm -hmm. his oration. Then in April, we have the skirmish at Lexington and Concord, which then leads right. to the siege of Boston. Sure. All right. Well, Katie and Professor Allison, that looks like all the time we have today, but Professor Allison, thank you so much for joining Katie and me for a very informative conversation, and we hope you'll join us again in the not-too-distant future, because as Revolution 250 gets rolling, there's an awful lot of topics that we're going to touch on with the Joseph Warren Historical Society, so we thank you very much for My joining pleasure. us today. My pleasure. Great to talk to both of you. Yep. Yes, I echo that, Professor. It was so nice to speak with you today. I learned so much 
and uh, to our viewers, we hope that you've enjoyed another in a series of interviews from the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society. Please consider subscribing to our channel as we'll be continuing these discussions with various authors and experts. My name is Katie Turner Getty and on behalf of my colleague Randy Flood and myself, thank you so much for watching and we'll see you next time.